They know that's a lie. If you actually, now today, if you, because we've, we've got a lot of research now since they floated this in the 70s. If you call up a researcher from Eli Lilly, and, and let's say you're a journalist and do this, they will start out with that story. They'll say, oh, well, it's like insulin for diabetes, it corrects an imbalance. And you'll say, well, no, it doesn't. It blocks, you know, you've done your research of what's sent to the FDA. And you'll say, no, it blocks these neurotransmitters profoundly. That's, and that's not balancing anything. And they say, oh, well, that's true. So the guys at Eli Lilly will back away from that in two seconds. And you'll say to the Eli Lilly guy, what's the evidence for it? And the Eli Lilly guy will be honest, we don't have it. By the time of 7980 and they've investigated it, they have reason to think it's not, that story is not very accurate. By 92, they know it's not accurate. And that's the moment it moves from maybe a flimsy hypothesis to when they keep on saying it, to where it's fraud because they know it's not really true. By 92, 94, etc. They know, and if you, if you, for example, if you read in Science Magazine today, June, January 17, 2003, the guy's very much behind the biological story. They ask him, what causes schizophrenia? And they answer, we don't have the slightest idea. Well, the question is, is you know, what researchers know among themselves in terms of what the drugs mm -hmm. do and, and, and what might be a cause of schizophrenia, etc. So you go to the Zyprexa.com website and it says Zyprexa fixes a chemical imbalance, okay? So that's one story out there. But now I go to Science Magazine, okay, which is a story that they're telling among themselves. And, if, and we're talking biological guys, Steve Hyman, Carol Taming, etc. And science journalist says, what causes schizophrenia? And they respond, we don't have the slightest idea. That's January 17, 2003. So, I think the, and the precise thing is the mechanisms are totally unknown. And I asked a guy from Janssen, which makes Risperidone, why do you make these statements? It's like insulin for diabetes. He says, well, it gets people to take their drugs. It's a story that they can understand. That's Whoa. what they tell you. That, so, and I said, so it's not real. They said, no, of course not. It, we know it's much more complicated, etc. But it's, it's a way to get people to take their drugs. I mean, the thing is, it's not just Lauren's study. Okay? It, it, first of all, Lauren replicates it. But it's not just one isolated study. The WHO, who data, too? Well, there's the WHO data. There were two other studies in the 1970s. Uh, you mentioned one that started in 69, Rappaport study. Okay. Here's how compelling this. First of all, there's three studies of this sort in generally where that I could find, NIMH funded in the 1970s, that took newly diagnosed patients and either put them on standard drug care or some sort of experimental form of care. So Terry House was one. Rappaport and the, inha the one your, your wife was talking about the other night, Will Carpenter's study. And each of those three studies, the relapse rates, were higher for the drug treated group. So it's not just Lauren's study here that you've got to ask why they didn't pay attention to. And again, we're talking about a target symptom. Now let's even go back in the 1960s, the first NIMH study that launched this whole revolution. It's like a nine hospital study. It's, it's I think, published in 63, roughly. At six weeks, they say, you know the study. The drug-treated patients are doing better. And who paid for this study? This is NIMH. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we've, got, we've actually got four arms. Okay. We've got three drug-treated groups with a neuroleptic and a placebo arm. And after six weeks, they say the drug-treated groups are doing better, okay, by whatever their outcome variable is. And this actually is the moment that the drugs, in my mind, where, where they talk about the drugs differently. They're no longer tranquilizers. They even say this in the report. They're anti-schizophrenic in kind. But what happens a year later when they come back? The relapse rates, the hospitalization rates, are highest for the three drug-treated groups. So that's also telling us on the target symptom that something's going on with those drug-treated patients that's causing some biological change that's increasing their vulnerability to relapse over time. So all I'm trying to add here to this conversation is it's not just Lauren's study that has to be ignored. There's a body of evidence. Right. And then the WHO evidence comes in. That adds to it. There was a... Who was the guy who's, who replicated your study in Switzerland? Chompy. Chompy does his... his his so house in, uh -huh. in, in Switzerland, and he writes, surprisingly, so in other words, if he has a bias, it's still towards the drugs. Surprisingly, those patients who received no or very little medication had significantly superior results. So it keeps adding up, and I think the point is, it's not just one study, but it's something that repeats 
from all these different angles. Yeah. And now you have to ask the question, why is it ignored?